question in our mind, and we have been warning the country about this since 1975, and the country has now come more so to believe our view than the opposite view contended, that Manley's ultimate aim is to take Jamaica into the Cuban orbit and to transform the society into a Cuban-type society. They have, in fact, implemented many of the types of institutions that are necessary for the transformation. What sort of thing? Training programs. We have, for instance, some 1,000 Jamaican youths that have now been trained in Cuba under a program that has come to be known as the Brigadista program because the purpose of the program is to set up Marxist-Leninist brigades to return to Jamaica to indoctrinate the peasant people and the working class people. The relationship with Cuba arises partly because Cuba is our closest neighbor, partly because Jamaica has always had a, a friendship that is, is traditional, really. With Cuba, it goes back into the 19th century. We find that we both share a deep commitment to the liberation process. We take a similar view of, we took a similar view of Nicaragua. We take a similar view of South Africa. We took a similar view of Ian Smith. Do you take a similar view of America? Um, no, I don't think we take an, a, a, a similar view of America. I think they have, of course, a very um, unusual and painful experience. Do you think that your support of uh, Dr. Castro and a certain number of his causes, um, that having Cubans here, has helped to antagonize the United States towards Jamaica? Well, first of all, I've never supported Dr. Castro and his causes. I've discovered points where we have similar causes. We share causes. I don't support his causes, nor he mine for that matter. But that the relationship has contributed to and been the cause of strain with the United States. Of that, there's no question. It's a matter of principle. Why did you do it? I, I mean, because it is a matter of principle. Because to me, it is an absolute matter of principle, and it isn't negotiable, and it will never be, no matter what price is paid. It is not negotiable for me to believe that a small country has to determine its policy by reference to what some powerful neighbor feels. Come as all I can say. The international community has been run by the big powers for hundreds of years, and where are we? Where are we? Upsetting Jamaica's powerful neighbor seems to have been a manly speciality. When he came to power in 1972, he moved into head-on conflict with the interests of American big business. Bauxite is big business. It's the raw material from which aluminium is made. It's only found in a handful of countries and Jamaica has two billion tons of it. Before Manley came to power, the entire Jamaican bauxite industry was controlled by six North American companies. The country's greatest natural asset belonged to someone else. The Jamaicans received only a pittance in royalties, about $40 million a year. After they were elected, Manley's government began to negotiate with the bauxite companies, and after fierce resistance, began to buy into the industry, mainly by compulsory purchase. Two years later, Jamaica was paying for a 51% controlling interest, and her revenue from bauxite had gone up to $200 million a year. That, that agreement creates a new and, we believe, historic partnership between the company and Jamaica. The local private sector has not cooperated. Now, depending on your point of view, you can see this as either a lack of patriotism verging on sabotage, or you can blame that all on the government, depending on your point of view. Our feeling about it is this, my own feeling about it is this, that Jamaica was an extremely elitist society and a society by no means marked by concern for social justice, that Jamaica had to begin to tackle the question of the fundamental social relationships of the society, and we did that. We did that consciously and deliberately because it had to be done, in our view. We also formed the International Bauxite Association, a producer's cartel similar to OPEC in the oil industry. It was to ensure that poor countries got the maximum revenue from one of their few natural resources. But more significantly, it was the first time 
that Manley, using his socialist principles, went into action against American huge corporations and won. Manley's foreign policy certainly opened up new contacts with the Eastern Bloc. He sought to move the Jamaican economy away from its dependence on the West. Visits like this one to Russia in April 1979 were aimed at opening up trade contacts. Manley believed that the centrally planned economies of the communist world could provide him with more secure markets for Jamaica's bauxite and sugar exports. New partners for bauxite would lessen the grip of the North American market. The Russians were also an alternative source of loans. These overtures to the East were treated with suspicion by the West. In American eyes, Jamaica holds a strategic position in the Caribbean with a new leftist regime in Nicaragua joining that in Cuba. The Americans perceived a growing threat to their sphere of influence. Manley's friendly relationship with Cuba particularly disturbed the Americans. The Jamaican Labour Party saw the Cuban embassy in Kingston as a hostile source of alien plans and plots. The Cuban connection became a major election issue among JLP supporters. Cuba was portrayed as fostering election violence. They are not good. They come to mash up Jamaica. They bring guns to killing off our own black people in Jamaica. We don't like the Cuban, none at all. No way. Or the Russian. At a pre-election press conference, Manley defended his relationship with Cuba. It was similar to any other country. As far as the future is concerned, we intend to continue in exactly the same way, respectful of each other's sovereignty, not interfering in each other's affairs, finding those points where two poor countries can cooperate and make common cause for worthwhile objectives which can be pursued internationally. To the left. It's very possible uh, that uh, Jamaica may become a totalitarian state or attempt to do so. Uh, I found that politically the highest priority in any government is self-preservation of the politician. And if Mr. Manley's eyes, he is not capable of re-election, uh, the first sign will be a delay of the election and possibly a cancellation of any elective process. He's campaigning now. I mean, he said there's going to be an election. Well, uh, that's entirely possible, but uh, if polls begin to indicate that uh, the electorate does not agree with the politician that's campaigning, and he's in a position of power to uh, cancel or uh, uh, delay elections, then it's within the realm of possibility that election may not be held. It's been said to me that if you win the next election, because you have Marxists very powerful in your own, in your own party, that that's the first major step towards you creating Jamaica into a totalitarian one-party state. People have said that to me. They said that before 1972. They said it before 1976. They said it before my father won his first election in 1955. They said it before the election that he lost in 49. They said it before the election that he lost in 44. They said it before the election that he lost in 67. They will go on saying it to the end of time. It's good politics to say it. It's a lie. Has it ever occurred to you? No, it has never occurred to me. It's just not relevant to the Jamaican situation. You have Marxists in your own party. Say you left the political scene. Your party would then be firmly in the hands of committed Marxists. No, this is a, you know, this use, use of this term. I heard you say that before, and I, I didn't want to be rude and interrupt you. Uh, about powerful Marxists in the party. What does one mean by that? I mean, I read Marx and think Marx is one of the most important thinkers in, in world history. Does that make me a Marxist in the sense in which you use the term? You have Marxists or, in your party who exercise there's a, a enormous lot of people, of A lot of people who have read Marx, admire Marx, and think a lot of the Marxist analysis is relevant. But if by Marxist you mean communist, the answer is no. In 1944, in 1949, journalist Avon Blake published a series of articles in his Spotlight magazine drawing attention to the absence of black Jamaicans working in the commercial banks except in menial positions. That same year, Bishop Percival James Gibson, the headmaster of Kingston College, responding to a request from Barclays Bank for a clerk, asked for indications of interest from the sixth form. All the boys, either white or near white, raised their hands. 
Roy McFarlane, an outstanding student who was black, did not raise his and on being asked why, replied, You set a bank, sir, and they don't employ black boys like me. Bishop Gibson gave McFarlane a letter of recommendation to the bank and informed the manager that depending on his response, he would hear about the matter further from the pulpit of Stee George's church. Roy McFarlane was hired. A similar initiative came from Excelsior. Junior Wedderburn, a member of the 1949 Sixth Form at Excelsior, recalls that in response to Blake's articles, the Sixth Formers decided to act. A small group of us decided that the time had come to end this practice in the banks, and the strategy to be used was that of a test case. Edna French was perhaps the brightest member of our class. She was the choice. She applied to the bank for a job as a teller and was required to write examination for accountants. She came first among all the candidates who wrote that exam and became the first black person to work as a clerk in a bank in the land of her birth. The admission of McFarlane and French to the staff of Barclays Bank in 1950 was not entirely due to their academic qualification, Bishop Gibson's insistence, or Avon Blake's militant journalism. The KSAC again entered the fray. In 1948, PNP Councillor Ken Hill moved a resolution calling for the erection of a suitable statue of Marcus Garvey to be erected and prominently placed in the city. Finally, early in 1950, while the applications of Edna F. French and Roy McFarlane were pending, another PNP councillor, C.G. Walker, moved a motion in the council calling on the banks to stop the discrimination since there were black men and women suited to fill any white-collar bank job requiring. Honesty, efficiency, and responsibility. Even after the employment of McFarlane and a French, the work environment in the bank remained unbearable for blacks. White employees objected to using the same bathroom, and other discriminatory practices persisted. Both McFarlane and French resigned. The third black Jamaican to be employed by Barclays Bank in a clerical position was Donald Addison Banks, who came to the bank in 1952 with the confidence and ability to take on all challenges. Banks, born into a family of educators, was outstanding in both academics and sports at Walmer's Boys School. His ironclad integrity was underpinned by his Christian values, and on Sunday mornings he took his place as a member of the choir at Christ Church in Vineyard Town. Beginning as a bank clerk, he overcame all obstacles to become the first black bank manager in 1964 and deputy general manager in 1972. 